Welcome, everyone. It's really good to see you. We're hoping for a really uh, constructive and creative and helpful hour for you. Um, we've called this, as you know, this webinar is called Leading Through the Tensions. Uh, as uh, people who work for CPAS, we're part of this Anglican mission organisation that works in the UK and we aim to resource church leaders to lead their churches in mission around the country and Ireland. We run holidays for Christian holidays for children and young people in the summer and we act as patrons to around 690 churches. If you'd like to know more about CPAS or give us all your money, um, do go to our website and see what's going on um, there. Before we pray, I'm just going to ask James to introduce himself and our topic for our time together. Good afternoon, everyone. Lovely to see you all. Thank you so much for joining us. James Lawrence uh, will work alongside Pam for CPAS. Uh, in leadership, there are always tensions that we face. And at the moment, there seem to be some particular ones uh, that we've been able to identify. So we're going to explore four that have bubbled to the top of the surface and offer some principles for managing tensions well, and then give you an opportunity to share ideas on other tensions and how to manage them uh, in the breakout rooms. So we hope this will be a helpful time because if we can handle these tensions in an appropriate way, uh, that's gonna be good for those that we're called to serve at this time. Uh, folks, we sent you a link to a handout with your joining instructions. If you haven't printed out your handout and you want to do now, there is a link to that in the chat. Um, after we've heard from James, we will go into breakout rooms just for a little while as a chance to process what we've heard and also talk about things that are working well in our in our context. We will finish promptly at three o'clock, uh, but if you'd like to stay on, James and I will be here to take some further questions after that. Um, just also a word, if you send us a private message, that's really lovely we probably won't be able to reply in the cut and thrust of the webinar. So don't be offended if we don't get back to you. Folks, we're gonna pray before we start. So maybe you'd just like to down tools, take a breath. And I'm going to use some words from Colossians 1, 9 to 14, Paul's prayer for people as a prayer for us. Paul writes, for this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience, while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Amen. Glorious stuff, isn't it? What a thing to be prayed. Uh, we're going to hand over to James now for our input. Uh, as always, if you'd like to post some comments in the chat as we go through, do. If you'd like to ask questions, if you can remember to put them in capitals, it just helps us to spot them. Thank you so much, James. Thanks, Pam. Just going to share my screen. And before we dive into our topic this month, I wonder if I can ask, how are you doing? Any leader that has navigated through Easter this year with all the last minute changing regulations and options, I think has done an amazing job. If you're still standing, well done. I've chatted to a number of leaders post Easter who've managed to take their normal sort of post Easter break but actually have not necessarily found themselves restored in the ways that they might expect. And one of them described suffering a little bit from sort of post Easter blues. And to a degree that's inevitable after such a huge expenditure of energy over that Holy Week. And especially this year with all those added complications that were thrown in. So if you're a leader and you're feeling a little flat or weary or wondering when it's all going to end, don't be surprised. 
you're not the only person in that situation. I wonder how things are for you. And alongside some of that reality, of course, we remember the good news of Eastertide. Christ is risen. And thankfully, he's sitting at the right hand of the Heavenly Father, interceding for us. I find that such an encouragement to think that Jesus is praying for you and is praying for me today, knowing everything about us and all the needs that we have. He is still king and he is still at work. And I pray that there may be something of this afternoon which will enable us to take courage and strength from those truths. Well, as we continue to journey through the government roadmap, we want to identify four tensions we might be experiencing at this time. These are the ones that in our conversations with people have sort of bubbled to the top of the surface. And of course, there are others. And in the breakout rooms, you'll have time to share some of the other ones. And you may want to even share them in the chat as I'm talking. But these are the ones that we've heard. And then I want to offer some principles for how to manage uh, some of these tensions well. So here are the four tensions that have bubbled to the surface. The two are perhaps specific to the pandemic, and the second two perhaps have been exacerbated by the pandemic, but are more general tensions. Tension number one, the tension between online and on-site. And I know that at this point, many of us are trying to make sense of this tension. I talked with a vicar last week who was desperate not to lose contact with those who have connected with them online over the past months. But the reality of being back in the church building has meant there's simply not enough time to run a separate online service. So they're trying to get their heads around the seven options we mentioned in last month's webinar, which actually we suggested weren't really seven, but probably more accurately five options. And I know many of us are grappling with this tension at this point. It's taking up a lot of our time and our energy with advocates on both sides. It's a very common tension to be experiencing. Here's the second tension that we keep hearing of. It's the tension between recovery and reshape. If you've been joining us in any of these webinars before, you know we're using this as a bit of a, a roadmap for us as we journey through the pandemic, uh, the three phases of response, recovery and reshape. And we've suggested that right now, April, we are in the very depths of the recovery phase as we try to help people make sense of their own pandemic experience. Yet, alongside that as leaders, we always need to have our eye ahead of the game. And so we're looking to that reshaping phase whenever it might come, September maybe onwards, and need to be doing some work now reimagining how we might best engage with the future of the church. And herein lies a tension, the tension between giving a time and energy to recovery and also needing to think maybe a little bit about reshape. And if only it was as simple as that, because in reality, in our communities, we've got people who are in all three stages and moving between them as well. And then here are two other tensions which are very common, but actually may have been exacerbated by the pandemic. Now, the third tension is between in-care and outreach. In-care is a horrible word, but I had to find a word which would fit in the space, so forgive me. What I mean by it is this, uh, wanting to care for our existing congregation. Uh, we want to try and regather them, uh, reconnect them, find out how they're doing, support them through their own challenges and difficulties and re-engage with the newly de-churched who we've not seen maybe for many months uh, over this last year. And at the same time, we want to reach out to the community, make the most of the openness to bigger questions that there seems to be around. We want to engage the new online fringe that's developed uh, and the new community connections that we might have seen. And I don't know about you, but I. I hear stories of one church that's doing an amazing job of caring for people, leading them gently and sensitively through the recovery phase, providing maybe pastoral support to individuals or, or developing pastoral groups. And I think to myself, oh, we should be doing better at that. And then I hear of another church the next day who's providing hundreds of meals a week to those who are struggling to feed themselves. They've got dozens of people in their online inquiries course. They're doing an amazing work in their local schools. And I think, oh, we should be doing better at the hat. And therein lies a tension, the tension between in-care and outreach. 
And here's the fourth one, the tension between personal and ministry needs. Now, again, this one always exists, but I think it has been made more difficult by the pandemic. I was talking to a leader a couple of days ago who said they feel that they've really struggling at the moment. They've described it in terms of having lost their mojo over the last year. And part of the struggle is they feel guilty about thinking about themselves and their need to recover when actually there are so many other ministry needs around them. And again, I think that's a tension many of us will be able to resonate with. Four tensions that have bubbled to the surface uh, that you may yourself be experiencing as well. Well, let's find out a little bit. Uh, as often we have done, we're gonna do a quick poll and uh, I'll pop the poll up on the screen. There are four questions this time. The first one, just about what you're doing in terms of your main service. Are you back in your building yet or not? Then one about the five options for the future. And then the question about which tension of the four tensions feels the biggest one to you. And then question four, which one feels the second biggest one to you? Uh, again, as always, apologies to those of you who can't do the polls. Some devices don't allow polls, but I know the majority of you will be able to do it. Scroll down the screen and you'll find the other questions. And don't forget to hit the submit button at the bottom of the screen. I'll give you just a minute to complete the poll. And uh, let's have a little look at the results. Here we go. So uh, in terms of uh, main services and in-building, 72% of us, do you know, that's that's really quite funny, isn't it, Pam? Yesterday, we had, uh, this morning, we had exactly the same percentage, 72% in-building and 28% not yet back in-building. Second question, uh, in-building services, live streaming seems to be the most popular way of trying to engage with that online, on-site reality. And then uh, in terms of the big tensions, the recovery reshape one, 49% of us see that as our biggest tension. And then the second biggest, uh, actually, again, recovery reshape, quite closely followed by the in-care outreach one. So uh, a number of things that we're resonating with when it comes to the different tensions that we might be experiencing. Well, how do we handle tensions well? Let me return to sharing my screen. Uh, how do we handle tensions well? Uh, how do we, if you like, lead through those tensions? Some years ago, I read a really helpful book in which the author talked about the difference between problems and tensions. And she explained how important it was to take the relevant approach to each of these, to make sure that we solve problems and manage tensions. And I found that such a helpful distinction in my own leadership. Because if you try to do it the other way around, things go very wrong. If you try to manage problems and solve tensions, we get into all sorts of hot water. A problem to solve is, for example, people online not being able to hear what is going on in a live stream service. Uh, it's not a good idea to try and manage that. We need to solve it and try to get on it as quickly as we can and solve the problem so people can hear. Or a biblical example would be in Acts 6, when the Hellenistic Jews were being overlooked in the distribution of food. That's a problem they needed to solve. And, and when they did, I love it that the scriptures tell us the word of God spread with the number of disciples increasing. So if we spot a problem, we need to lean into it. Whereas the four tensions we've just mentioned aren't solvable, they need to be managed. And a big biblical example of that for Paul would be uh, the tension between establishing newly planted churches and moving on to plant more churches was a tension that he will have needed to manage. And if you ask, how do you tell the difference between a problem and a tension? Maybe these three questions might help us. Does the issue keep recurring? Because once this problem is solved, it should stay solved. Uh, if it keeps recurring, it might well be an indicator that you're looking at a tension. Secondly, are there mature advocates on both sides? If there are those who are mature and speaking strongly for both sides, then you may well have a tension because neither side is right. They're just noticing two different parts of something which need to be held in tension. And the third question, are the two sides really interdependent? Because if they are, it's more likely to be a tension to manage. It won't be a problem to be solved. Andy Stanley suggests these three questions are helpful. And he goes on to say this, the role of leadership is to leverage the tension for the benefit of the kingdom. 
I think that's really helpful because what it reminds us of is that normally within attention is an opportunity for creativity, for progress and for health. That attention can be dynamic and if handled well, can lead us to better places. And part of our role as leaders is to get on the, the sort of get on the side of the tension that means that we're leveraging it for the benefit of the kingdom. So how do we do that? Well, here are four principles for managing tensions that I hope might be of help. Principle number one, acknowledge it, name it publicly, if at all possible. There is a tension between this and that. And when we do that, try to describe it both factually and emotionally, if we can. So let's take that recovery, reshape tension. Uh, if we were to try and acknowledge that, it might sound a little bit like this. Folks, we have a tension here between those who want us to focus on all our energies on helping people to process their experience of the pandemic over the next few months and those with a pastoral heart are burdened by the level of loss and anxiety and fear, and they long to help people with recovery. But we also have people in our congregation who long to reshape the church for its future mission and ministry, believing there's much to be learned through this last year. And there are many opportunities that lie before us that it would be a travesty to miss out on. Folks, both these things are important. So let's work out how we manage this tension together. Principle number one, acknowledge it, name it, describe it as much as we can. Principle number two that might help us as we manage tensions is to accept there is no quick solution. So we can stop wasting our energy looking for one and recognize that as we embrace the tension, we will have to try things. We'll have to have a go. We will inevitably make mistakes and we will learn together. And in all of this, we'll need to keep reminding people of the why, why we are here, why we exist, why we do what we do. Because in the midst of a big tension, it's very easy to get down into the weeds of the what's and how's and to lose perspective and a bigger picture sense of the why. So our role as leaders, as always, is to get people's eyes up out of the weeds every now and then and remind them of the why that actually will help us as we manage the tension. There is no quick solution, but there are always going to be ways forward. Principle number three, keep communication channels open, particularly between those who are on the two sides of the tension. Listen carefully to the champions who will need to be heard so that their views are validated, but also to the underdog who is rarely heard. Don't weigh in too quickly with our own personal preferences because our words carry extra weight because we're the leader. The danger will be that we will have a preference on one side and we'll name it too quickly and too loudly, and that will close down the entirely valid other side of the tension. And don't allow strong personalities to win the day. In any church, there are always those whose voice tends to dominate. Be careful about allowing them to dominate. And we do that by continually valuing both sides of the tension. Let's keep the communication channels open and help people to listen to and hear one another. And then the fourth principle is this. Make decisions on the basis of a number of things. Make decisions on the basis of common strengths. Interestingly, research suggests that where possible, it helps to look to strengthen what both sides have in common. Let me give you an example. In that in-care outreach tension, both sides would benefit from the nurturing of new leaders because then those new leaders could help take a lead on both sides, some on the side of in-care and some on the side of outreach. Both sides would benefit from identifying a common strength that would enable both sides to make some progress. So make decisions on the basis of any common strengths that you can identify. Make decisions on the basis of flow, not fair. Don't think in terms of being fair or being balanced, 
but rather think about the flow. Uh, in this period, we're going to give more attention to this side of the tension. But in a few months, we'll give more attention to the other side of the tension so that the flow may move on one side of the tension to the other, rather than coming up with a sort of an unhealthy mismatch of very little trying to please everyone at the same time. It helps sometimes to make decisions on the basis of flow rather than flair. So again, let me give an example. Take the online on-site tension. Uh, the flow at this time may need to be towards online as we are still working out how to do this well so that we continue to engage those who've joined us online and those who've been able to attend something online who could not physically attend in a building. And then in the future, we may need to give a bit more time to on-site and how we, again, nurture that a little bit further. Or it may be that in your situation, you need to do the flow the other way around. Either way, think flow, not fair. Third thing that will guide us in terms of making decisions is the resources that are available. We probably can't address all the tensions at the same time. So let's weigh up what resources we have and what we can address. Although just as a quick aside, don't forget to ask for resource. I was talking to a church recently who were going to, they decided that they were going to stream uh, their services on site and stream them online, but they had no provision for that in their building. They asked the congregation if they could help and within four days had raised 6,000 pounds to buy the equipment that would make that possible because they sold the why so well. We want to continue to engage people who've been able to join us and can't join us physically yet. So what resources are available? Which tension are you gonna work with now and which one might you need to park? And then make decisions on the basis of prayer, last but definitely not least. As always, we're looking to discern what God is doing. As always, we're looking for his wisdom and how he might help us shape where we give our time, energy and attention. So four principles, acknowledge it, accept there's no quick solution, keep communication channels open and make decisions on the basis of those four things. Well, in a moment, you're going to have an opportunity to name other tensions and then maybe take one of the four that we've already identified and work with it practically and to share your ideas and insights about how to manage tensions well. But as we ponder and pray about the tensions that we face and as we work with others to manage tensions well and solve problems along the way, and as we remind people of why we are here as the people of God, may the Christ who is risen and is interceding at the right hand of God, guide us and empower us to lead in his strength and for his glory. May he give us his wisdom so that we make wise decisions in managing tensions well and finding the dynamic creative potential that is within them. Pam, back to you. Thank you, James. Thank you so much. Folks, we're gonna spend 14 minutes precisely in our breakout rooms just to process what we've heard uh, and to share our own ideas of things that are working well in leading through tensions. And when you go into your room you'll have to reopen the chat to get a reminder of the questions, although you might want to take a photo if we can show the questions now. Uh, if you prefer to do that. Uh, we know it can be awkward when you go into a group with people you don't know, um, but please be bold and brave uh, and please appoint someone just to lead your conversation. Someone dive in and do so. And if you would like to, there is a link to a Padlet board, which is a bit like just a shared whiteboard really, where you can write up things that, um, ideas that you've had. Uh, so if, you, if someone would like to do that for your group, that would be great. Um, when we come back together, we will have the chance to do some Q&A with James. So do make note of any questions that you'd like to ask, and then you can put them in the chat, the main chat, when we come back. And I think those are all the instructions. So have a really creative time, and we look forward to seeing you in 14 minutes. Welcome back, everyone. I hope that was a, a useful time. We've got some time now for your questions. Um, we've got a good lot of questions to start us off. 
from before the breakout rooms. We're going to have questions now, so do um, add questions into the chat. We won't be able to get to all of them, but we'll uh, get to as many as we can. So here we go. Um, James, I know you had an email in advance asking you about the best language to use when talking about buildings and services online, and I know you feel quite strongly about this, so would you like to say some more about that? Yeah, just to respond, um, and forgive me for those who've heard me say this before, but I think language matters because language shapes culture. And so as leaders, there are often occasions where we, we choose our words very carefully because we know we will shape the culture, the reality, if you like, uh, by the words that we use. And I think this is one of those occasions in this, this whole thing about virtual or in-person or face-to-face -face or digital or physical. So here are the words that I'm choosing not to use. I'm not using the word virtual because actually what we're doing is real, even if it is online. I'm not using the word in person because actually what we're doing is in person. Now you are a person and I'm a person and we're engaging with one another. Uh, I'm not using face to face because we are face to face. In fact, there are some ways in which online is more face to face than offline, interestingly, particularly when it comes to public worship. Um, and, and I know some like the language of digital and physical. I, I can see that might be helpful, but I'm not sure it's the one I would choose. The words that I'm using are online and on site or online and in building because they are simply descriptors of where we're meeting. They don't say anything else. And I think that's quite helpful. The danger is if we believe the future is going to be hybrid and, and we at CPS believe it will be that we're not going to stop using Zoom in the future for meetings or maybe for public worship. We're not going to stop doing things online for the future. There are some real advantages to online we want to continue to embrace. So to be careful about using language like virtual and in-person face-to-face, which tends to suggest this is better than this is not helpful. I want to just say they're different and they both have advantages and they both have disadvantages. So choose your words carefully, I suppose, is the encouragement. Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, James, do you have any strategies for stopping tensions escalating to relationship issues? Um, yes, although um, I, I'd be really interested to see what other strategies are for that because that's such a helpful question. Um, one of the strategies is, is, is one of the things I was saying, if you can acknowledge the tension uh, and help people to understand it by the way you describe it, you are less likely to go down into the conflict level, which is where you want to get away from. Uh, that would be one of the important things. Um, another one would be that when it comes to, um, uh, con if one can see it's heading towards conflict, lean into it engage those who you think the temperature is rising so high that conflict is is coming or, or has already come if you're conflict adverse like me your tendency will be to step away from it but actually the key as a leader is to step towards it because if you step away if i step away from a conflict i can see that's coming it will only get worse it is very unlikely that it will get better on its own so the courage I need as a leader is to, oh, I can see that person A and person B, this is rising above tension to conflict. I need to step in, step forward and engage them. Might be one to one. It might be to get them together. You know, all sorts of ways we might manage conflict well. Those would be my two things. Acknowledge the tension to prevent the conflict starting. And if you see the conflict happening, step towards it, not away from it. Thank you. Uh, and another one about doing relationships well. How do we stop church folk from projecting all the issues around church at the moment, maybe giving, maybe attendance onto the vicar um, and avoiding responsibility themselves for sorting some of those things? Mm -hmm. Really helpful question again. And one of the things we've talked about in previous webinars is that um, at the moment, those who are ministers, clergy, leaders of churches or congregations are often on the receding end of anxiety, anger and accedi. And uh, that has been um, made worse because of the pandemic situation that people have been going through. So actually, a lot of us are finding in our leadership that we're, we're, we're receiving a lot more critical stuff than we maybe are used to. Um, 
And part of it as a leader is to just realize what's going on. Projection is occurring. And as mu- it's often as much about internal issues as it is about the named issue that they have identified. Uh, the second thing is um, uh, helping people to understand that uh, uh, what we are as the body of Christ is an ongoing part of our work as church or congregation leaders. Um, who we are and why we exist are two fundamental things that we're always trying to encourage people to understand. Because the idea that um, congregation members are passengers or um, those who, who somehow are receivers of the ministry of the ordained is an unhelpful understanding of church. We're all called to ministry with a body of Christ. And so there's a teaching ministry that we all engage in on an ongoing basis, both one to one and in uh, one to many in groups and uh, on Sundays. That's about helping people to remind uh, to understand what it means to be the body of Christ, why we exist as the body of Christ and therefore how we operate as a result of those two things. Um, and that takes years to form the culture of a church uh, if, a cult- if the culture of a church is different to that. But it's such an important part of our work um, because actually it then enables us to function as a body where we all look to take responsibility for the things we need to take responsibility for and don't simply expect the minister to do it for us. Thank you, James. Um, there's another one. Uh about dealing well with people how do we graciously ask people to attend and assist rather than just sit at home criticizing it so it's the same similar angle onto yeah, different yeah. Angle to what you've just said yeah um I, I wonder if the start of that is to to make sure we are asking why people are doing what they are doing um Uh, Again, sorry, I've I've said this before, but I do think um, having an inquiring rather than a judgmental approach to people is really important at at this time. Find out their story. Because there may be all sorts of reasons why people are doing what they're doing or being how they're being. And we won't know those reasons unless we've come with an inquiring spirit. Tell me, how has it been for you? What's going on in your life? What is your experience of the pandemic being how's it affecting you so that we get behind the presenting thing to whatever has been going on and um and then in terms of under if if that helps us to understand them better we'll know what's the right way to engage them better now it might be that we discover they're just being you know annoyingly awkward in which case that might need a slightly more robust challenge but i think more often than not what we'll discover is there's a story And that story, if we can understand it, will help us to know how to engage them and in helping uh, and and helping them uh, to engage through that. uh, We might find that attitude shifts and maybe their actions change as well. And then what about the people who've been sort of disengaging as time has gone on? Have, Have we got any great ideas of ways to gather people together again? Um, Because it's hard to keep the channels of communication open if people are gradually sort of drifting away. Yeah, yeah. Um, If you have the capacity to galvanise a small group of people to connect one on one with those who've been disengaging. And again, to do what I've just mentioned, to find out what their story is. I think that's going to be the best way to re-engage people. Uh, That's at the level of individuals. If the issue is more at the level of the sort of corporateness of the community of God, the people of God, um, I think we have to try and find every possible way to engage people, uh, be uh, that online or on site. Um, uh, And and it may be that it's worth just reflecting on what have we done so far that's worked well? Can we build further on that? What haven't we done that we could do that might be a new way of engaging people? And certainly um, uh, we've had to change our pattern of engagement in CPAS several times over the pandemic because what did work stopped working or or we needed to find a new way working. In fact, we're just in another period where as a team we're thinking, what what might we need to do differently to engage our our dispersed staff in a new way? And I I wonder if that's true for us as congregations as well. just to share ideas so here's a thought in chat why don't people share now any idea you've had that has helped 
connect people together as a whole and we can maybe then pick up on one or two of those ideas and think oh that's a good one i could do it i could try that one as well while you're doing that folks we'll focus in on a few things more specifically about tension um james you mentioned three opportunities that come out of being in a state of tension could you just remind us what they were please yes um i suggested that tension could be an opportunity for creativity for progress i.e movement and for health that the, the creativity and the progress might lead us to be more healthy as a as a people of god and i think handled well there is a gift within the tension if and as andy stanley talks about if we can leverage it for the sake of the kingdom that's a really good place to be thank you and then if we talked about uh the pressure to get back to normal and the need to rethink church life put those two things uh together are they a tension or a problem um uh, off the top of my head i don't know uh, but if we applied the three questions that i suggested we might begin to get a bit of an idea my hunch is they're a problem because it's a short-term thing that we need to work through in order for us to get somewhere different but it may be if i thought a bit more about it i might decide it's attention so i'm not quite <laughs> sure is the honest answer okay thank you um and then you spoke about what this thing about interdependent what, could you just unpack that for us a little bit? If the, you said if the two sides are actually independent, interdependent, what, what yes. did you mean? Yes, uh, let me take the example of in care and outreach. Now you could see those as two separate things, but actually they're interdependent. Um, you cannot do good outreach unless you have people to do it, in which case you need to do the in care uh, of nurturing the discipleship of those who are already part of the body of Christ. But if you flip it around the other way, um, you'll have nobody to care for in the future if you don't continue to do outreach, because ultimately, sadly, people will either move away or die and there'll be nobody left. So we need to continually do outreach as well. So that's going to be a tension for the rest of our days as the church, as it has been for 2000 years before now. And they are interdependent on one another. That's what I meant. And so sometimes when you ask that third question, you'll be able to work out. Yeah, actually, these two things do need each other in order for them to to to, to exist. And, and then it's going to be a tension that you'll have to manage forever. Um, if that third question you can't answer that you know, that you know, positively, there is no interdependence. It may still be a tension, but it may be one which doesn't last as long. Thank you. There are some lovely ideas here, James, of ways oh, of staying in touch with people, um, phone calls, small Zoom groups, walking with people, but getting them to read something beforehand so that you then talk about it together, uh, having a WhatsApp group where you ask people to do little things. Somebody talking about the Wonder app. That's a new one to me. I want to find out about that. Um, so lots of and, and encouraging people to look after one another and to call one another. So lots of things on there worth reading. Um, you I wonder, Pam, if I just yeah. before we move on, I uh, wonder if I can just um uh, encourage us as much as it is possible and i know it's not always possible but as much as it is possible um involve others in that connecting people so it's not just dependent on us would be a good way forward thank you thank you thank you um you talked james about the seven options for services that we'd come up with someone yeah. has asked for more about that um, uh, the quick answer is have a look at the recording of the webinar last time. Uh, that's the quick answer, um, because we talked more about it on the last webinar, the seven different options and how actually two of them probably aren't really options. We'd want to suggest the other five all seem to be good and possible options. Um, the, the one thing I will say from last time is this. Uh, it's really important, isn't it, to recognise that there are going to be some churches where it's simply not possible to continue to do online and on site. The resources simply aren't there and we need to recognize that and not beat ourselves up about it um uh, there will be other churches where we can continue to do online and on site and we've got to then work out which one of those other options we're going to choose um there's some really interesting uh new material that's just being created at the moment to try and help us with that it'll be coming out in the next month or so uh, and when it does come out i don't even know exactly what it's going to be called at the moment but we're, we're working on it with others uh it, just trying to help with the sort of um, options for the hybrid future 
Uh, but there's also lots of material that's already out there. And on the resource list, I've put um, a connection through to a, an interesting interview done with Pete, Peter Phillips, who is um, very helpful on this stuff. And there's a little video you can watch. Um, lots of webinars that are being run at the moment on hybrid future and what's that going to look like. So just tap into some of those as well. All sorts of in, uh, uh, interesting and helpful thinking going on. Uh, there's, uh, I just want to mention some of these other ideas that have come up, James. Yeah. Um, as someone saying, remember outside of church as part of your on-site yes. Yes. offering. Lots of um, people are doing that and enjoying it. Uh, Peter says, work with other churches and an artist to increase creative visibility in the community. What a lovely idea. So lots of things just to do communication well. Um, I think I have come to the end of the questions on the chat. If you've got more, um, please could you add them now? That would be really helpful. We've got just a few minutes left, so it'd be good to have more questions. James, is there anything you want to say uh, in response to the types of questions that we've had? Yes, thanks. Um, I, I think, I think, um... Um, uh, for all of us, we are more likely to manage the tensions if we are sharing the managing of the tensions with others. So again, where at all possible, these are the sorts of things to talk about with our elders team, our PCC, our church wardens, our staff team, whatever is the appropriate group in your, with our chapter meeting, uh, whatever's the appropriate group in your context because they are common tensions. And if we've got more people working with us on them, we're much more likely to come up with a wise way forward. Thank you. Um, Christine says, how do we encourage people who are able to get together to do so when they really enjoy the online provision mm -hmm. and without excluding those who can't come out of their homes? Yep, 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 yep. Um, I think it is simply about making the invitation, in, uh, inviting people to regather physically. Um, and, and as always, um, uh, invitations can be done well and they can be done poorly. Uh, you know how you receive an invitation to something, you know, social event and somebody's put a bit of thought into it and you think, gosh, that looks really exciting. Can't wait to go. And other times people don't put any thought into it. And you think, oh, not quite sure I can be bothered to go to that. So thinking carefully about how we make the invitation. And that often means including the invitation, something about the why, why it would be good for us to gather together on site. Uh, something about the, the concerns that people might have, that we address those to minimise them. And something about the benefit that we will gain from it. Those would be the sorts of things in making the invitation it might be good to think of. And, and recognise we're going to have to make that invitation again and again and again and again, because it's going to be months, months more before people um, get to the point where they're ready to respond and come. Thank you so much. Um, we have got another question, but I think we'll do that after we've officially finished. Folks, thanks. It's been so good to spend this time with you. Um, the resources that we have mentioned throughout the webinar uh, will be available to you. There's uh, a handout to download from the website and we will send the link to you for that. And you've just got a picture of it there. Um, we'll send the link to you tomorrow. Uh, we're rerunning our evangelism during COVID morning because it was so popular. Um, before so if you'd like to join that again do look at the details from the chat we'd also be grateful really grateful if you would fill in a feedback form because it just helps us to try and keep these webinars really relevant to what people are facing uh, each month as it passes um, and James and I will be around for the next 20 minutes or so if you've got further questions you'd like to raise but as we come to a close let's pray again together Go with us from this meeting, Lord, reminding us of all that each of us needs to ponder and to put into action. As we read at the beginning, may we be filled with the knowledge of your will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. In the lovely name of Jesus, we pray. Mm. Amen. Amen. So if you uh, have to leave us now, thank you so much for coming. Um, be blessed as you go on into the rest of the day. If you would like to stay, then please do. 
And I'm just going to try and find the question, James, that I had lined up for you <laughs> at this point. Yeah. Um, no, I've lost it. Perhaps the person might be able to ask it yeah. again. Yeah. And, uh, yeah oh, yes. Be... Uh, it was a suggestion about what, what could we read or watch to further, preferably things that are reasonably short, about managing tensions. Well. So in the resources handout that we've just given you the link to, and we'll send you the link tomorrow in an email, uh, I've put a, uh, two links there, one to uh, three links there, one to a 15 minute podcast that you could listen to uh, as you're out for your walk or whatever. Uh, really helpful by Andy Stanley on managing tensions. Another to another a video that you could watch on the upside of tensions. And then actually I've linked you also to an HBR, Harvard Business Review article, which is a little bit longer, but actually really thoughtful piece of research on how to manage tensions well. Um, it's about the business community, but there are some good lessons in there that enable us to think about how to manage tensions well. So there'll be three things there that might be of help for you. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of things. Will there be a recording of this available? Yep, the recording will go up in the next few days. And like all our previous webinars, the recordings, the resources, they're all up on the website uh, so that you can dip into them at any point and do recommend them to others if, if you think that might be of interest to them. I know some churches uh, where the um, folks who've attended the webinar have then shown the talk bit of the webinar to their leadership team or their PCC because it's been a way of giving them a little bit of a, a wider perspective and insight and then have had a conversation off the back of it. And so if that's helpful, the video will be there for you. Thank you. Um, someone else asking, are we rerunning PCC tonight as an online event again? Uh, yes, it's uh, on at the moment. There are a few places left. I think it's something like the 26th of May, but you'll find it on our website. Um, uh, um, but do book up fairly swiftly because there's not a huge number of places left. And then we'll be running it again in, I think it's November, but that date will go up after the May one. Thank you. Folks, has anybody got any more questions? Do unmute at this stage uh, and ask your question or wave at me and I'll try and see you. Anyone got a hand up or unmuting? Can I ask a question? It's yes, Helen. Helen. Um, it, you have done it before, so it's going over old ground, I realise, but I was confused about it last time, so I'll ask the question now. Um, you talk about the seven options, and there's only really five options, and one of the ones you say isn't an option is in building services, live stream, no change. Yeah. Is that really, you know, like no change? Yes. Because it so seems to it seems to me that the changes that we are making at the moment are a result of the fact, you know, we can't do singing. So we're not doing five verses with choruses. Yeah. That makes it more appealing online, but it's as it's, it's much a, a change for restriction. As yes. opposed to. Yeah, thank you. I hadn't thought about that. That's such a helpful qualification, Helen. Um, but what I meant by that is uh, let, let's imagine those restrictions have been eased. We can sing again. We can do all that sort of stuff again. Uh, what I meant was, um, if you simply live stream a, an inverted commas normal service and make no changes to it, that isn't the best way to do it mm. because it'll mean those who are watching are simply observing and they're not participating or engaging in any other way. Whereas a few small things, for example, the very simple thing of welcoming people. Mm -hmm. And as you welcome them, welcome to everyone who's in the building this morning. And welcome to those who are online and looking at the camera at that moment. That's a tiny little change that will help those people be a bit more engaged. Now, there are a whole range of other little things that you could do to engage those people. Um, one of them would be, uh, it, uh, I know some churches are doing this in the prayers of intercession. They're saying to those online, if you've got particular things you'd like us to be praying for uh, over the next few minutes, just pop them into the chat if you feel able to do that. And we will include those in our prayers of intercession. So then again, they're engaged in a different way. Um, I know that some are having an, if you like an online service leader at the same time, who's engaging with them on chat, uh, um, uh, on the chat as it's live stream. So there's a, a level of engagement there. So it's just small little things that we can do to okay. move it from simply observation mm. to actually encouraging participation as we would in the building. Yeah, but that's really helpful. Thanks, James. Yeah, no, thank you. I hadn't spotted the qualification I needed to put there. Thank you. Anybody else? Questions? Do Yeah, Nick. Me again. <laughs> um, I'm really wrestling with this sense of the role of the leader as being slightly ahead of the curve because I feel like so I'm 
I'm feeling like I'm in a different place to my congregation because I just keep hearing over and over and over again, we can't wait till it's back to normal. We're not coming back to church till it's back to normal. We're not blah, 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 all these kind of things. And I'm, I'm kind of feeling this real strong sense of we can't. Normal wasn't working. Normal was leading to decline. Normal was leading to consumerism. Normal was leading to people not engaging. And I'm, I'm really struggling with this tension because I love the peaceful, shorter, more space for prayer services that we've got at the moment. I, I can't sing and I'm not all that. Like I like to sing, but with a good worship band, which we don't have uh, with, a, t- with a, ca- a worship leader who's capable of leading people in worship, which we don't have. So like, I'm wrestling with my preference and my place ahead of the curve with where people are and mm. and just I don't know if there's an answer to, uh, even a question but just like some input into that. yeah yeah does that yeah, make yeah. sense yeah yeah so thanks um thanks Nick um I, I, I actually think again the, the language we use here is, is quite important because um the language of normal is probably not the most helpful language for us to be using And if we can reframe what we're talking about without using the word normal or new normal, that's probably going to be more helpful language to be using. Um, uh, um, That's the first comment. Um, I I think the 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 uh, one of the things that leaders do is they help people to understand reality. So if you are identifying that actually where we were pre pandemic was not heading in a healthy direction part of the job is to try and help people understand that reality so that they then begin to have a sense of do you know what we perhaps don't want to return to that because the trajectory doesn't look that good what we need to think about is what have we learned through the pandemic that might give us a different trajectory for the future so that would be the second thing and then the third thing is nick i think one always has to live a little bit with that tension between where we are and where other people may be and sometimes it's the other way around Uh, let's be clear about that, where people are maybe further ahead than where we are, and they have to live with that tension. But the conversation is so important, isn't it, to to, uh, provide a context in which people can have the conversation and surface what they're thinking um, and um, explore and learn and listen together about, ultimately, what is God doing in all of this? And where does he want to take us? Because that is what we are about. We're not about what does Nick want, We're not about what do other people want. Ultimately, we're all trying to work out what's God doing and and, and what does he want for his people? And our job as leaders is to try and help that conversation happen in a good, healthy, appropriate way so that we can identify, do you know what? Here's one small thing we could do and here's another small thing we can do and we can begin to make some movement in the direction we believe God might be taking us. Thank you. Michael, did you have your hand up? Michael Norman, if you did. No, no. Okay, there's one more in the chat, James. How do we involve the church in the reshaping of church when it's a PCC decision and we can't all meet up to talk? So I know many have been doing PCC online and doing it very well. So um, if you are able to do that, I'd encourage you to do it. Um, We've produced two guides to help PCCs do an online meeting. I think, can I stop you there? I think it's about how do we get the whole church involved Ah, when the whole church can't meet up and anyway, it's a PCC decision. Okay, thank you, thank you. Oh, good, yeah, good question. Sorry, I misunderstood it. Um, There are always ways to involve people. Um, at many different levels so for example one of the ways you could do is you could simply say to the whole congregation all congregations um, uh, we've got a PCC meeting coming up in two weeks time here's the main item that we're exploring on the agenda it's about how we reshape ourselves for the future we'd we'd love you to be praying about it and here are three or four things we'd love you to pray about so immediately you've now got a whole bunch of others engaged at the simplest level with what's going on. If you take it up a level, you could do it in this way. 
Um, we've got a meeting in a couple of weeks time and we're going to be thinking about this. We'd love to know what you think. Here are four questions we'd love you to answer. And if you take just five minutes to answer these by this date, it would really help us as we have the conversation on, on your behalf. That would be another way. Uh, if you take it up another level, you might actually say, um, we're, we're going to have an hour on Saturday morning or Friday night or whenever you decide, no, Friday night's never a good night, whenever would be a good night, um, where we're going to be talking about the future for our church. We'd love you to come along and then structure the evening in an appropriate way, do it on Zoom, structure the evening in an appropriate way, and you'll have engaged people. Uh, that's all to help inform your conversation as a PCC, but you're getting people involved in the process by the way let me stand on my soapbox just for one minute please if you have children and young people include them in that process in some way because they're the church as well now you could do any of those one of those uh, none of those and choose something else there's always a way of engaging the wider community now sometimes we might not choose to do that because we think it's not what we need to do but more often than not, it's much wiser to include people in the conversation if we can, because ownership of outcome comes through involvement in process. There's the critical leadership thing. Ownership, <laughs> ownership of outcome comes primarily through involvement with process. So the more we can involve people in the process, the more likely they're going to own the outcome of the process. Yeah. Of course, not it would depend on the size of your church, but let's imagine you've got 60 people in a church. Not everybody is going to be able to be in on the decision making moment. That's why you have a PCC. But they can all be involved in some level, in some way, at various points on the journey. And that's the healthy way forward. And if you have multiple congregations or multiple churches, um, the principles remain the same, although the exercise is a little more complex. Yeah. Um, but certainly it's good to get everybody involved. Yeah. Any more questions, folks? It's all gone quiet, James. I think we oh, might we may be done. To the end. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Hope you have a really good rest of the day. Be blessed in your leadership. Uh, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you so much, everyone. Goodbye. Lovely to see you all. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.